Hello. Hello. Hello, everyone at home. All right. Can you hear me? Please wave your hands if you can hear me. All right. All right. Wow. You are welcome to CMS Virtual Visit from Nigeria. We are live in point five in Sessi, France, where we have CMS Experimental Site located. My name is Babatunde John Odetayo. I'm an IT engineer and also a PhD student from University of Bini, Nigeria. I'm here in CMS, in CERN, to participate in activities related to CMS. Uh, I actually work in that group, and I'm um, working on a project which is operation and development of online CMS system administration. I'm going to be your host guide, and uh, I have the expert guides here with me. These guys, they are experts, and they have been doing this for decades. Uh, is uh, They are experts. I know what I'm saying. They are expert guys there, and uh, I'm, I'm assuring you that you are going to get the best from them uh, this morning. So let me if, invite them to introduce themselves and hand over to them. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Sonia Natale. I'm coming from Italy, from Rome. But uh, okay, yes. Uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. We have, you see, okay, I think, yes, exactly. There is a very interesting thing happening just uh, in this way. You see, there is a crane. You see, this is a really special connection because you see, we are. Uh, now working is a working place so you can see things happening in this uh, in this moment uh, we hope we know we are confident uh, uh, on our technicians as you see they are very good so we are not in danger <laughs> however coming back to as you follow the the, the work coming back to the uh, to to my introducing myself, so I was saying uh, I'm coming from Rome, Italy. Uh, as uh, Tunde said, are two decades. I'm here, <laughs> not doing all virtual visits, but however, uh, I'm a particle physicist, um, and I studied this in Rome. But uh, the last part of my of my studies were done here at CERN. Um, and then I continued with my PhD at University of Geneva, uh, accepting the contract uh, uh, supposed to build a particle physics detector to be installed in space. Uh, and in fact, this, de this detector, if uh, there are uh, among you people who wants to join uh, to be a particle physicist, but uh, with application in space, you become a, an astroparticle physicist as me. And uh, if you want to follow this experiment, it's just because uh, it's a funny thing, uh, just you change a letter. We are in CMS, so this is AMS. So uh, I will try also to make some connection about this. But today for you, I'm just CMS and I hope to enjoy uh, with you this visit. And I will be your eyes, your hands to visit this magnificent place to undress. All right, thanks, Sonia. Yeah, so my name is Andres. Uh, I am a physicist. I grew up in Puerto Rico and I uh, went on to study physics. Uh, I got a PhD from a university in the US and I spent some time here at CERN during that time. And so I continued to do research and I'm still uh, based here at CERN and I've been working with CMS for a long time. I specialize in the study and the measurement of a quantity we call luminosity, uh, which is related to the, the rate of interactions. And I can uh, discuss a, a little bit later, especially if there's questions, um, but maybe we can go ahead and get started. So we're going to be uh, chatting with you guys and talking a bit about what happens here at CERN and especially at CMS. And Sonia is gonna be showing you the underground areas, which will be very exciting. Uh, unfortunately, we won't be able to show you the actual detectors. It looks uh, very much like the image you see on the just behind us. In fact, this is a live uh, scale or, or real scale um, of the detector. Um, but the LHC is currently uh, going in, in collisions. So we call this stable beams. And unfortunately, we cannot be 
close to the detector, but we can go to the underground areas, which Sonia will show you. Yes, and in fact, okay, I will try to enjoy it to to make people experiencing the magnetic field uh, that we can still experience outside the car, the experimental cover. Uh, we will talk a little bit later about this. So I prepare myself, and you see, I have to wear. I cannot show you, but I have a special shoes uh, to go underground. I have to wear also an helmet. And uh, okay, I think I will prepare myself. I will leave the floor to my colleagues uh, to talk with you. Uh, we will talk all along uh, the journey. Okay, see you. Right, bye. Okay, so in the meantime, we can uh, maybe give you a bit of an introduction about CERN and uh, we were actually just chatting before we started the visit and there's a couple of things that are I think very interesting and perhaps we can actually show you a few slides uh, just in a second um, so okay so actually maybe we can first start with a picture of the area of where we are now. Yeah, so here you see an image, uh, a representation of the accelerator complex at CERN. And more often than not, when you hear about CERN, it's in the context of the Large Hadron Collider. But there's a lot happening at CERN. And in fact, there's also a rich history uh, of um, yeah, many experiments, a lot of science that's uh, been carried out at CERN. So CERN was founded in 1954, if I recall correctly. Uh, and since then, there's been a number of experiments and a number of accelerators. So one of those accelerators, one of the early accelerators was the proton synchrotron. And you can see this one, it's um, labeled as PS towards the bottom in a sort of a pink color. And you may also notice that it is labeled with the year 1959. So this accelerator was commissioned in around 1959. At the time, it was the most powerful accelerator. Uh, and several decades la later, they built an even bigger accelerator. So they call it the super proton synchrotron, of course. And um, Okay, so yes, let me just show you the PS or the proton synchrotron is just here. And then the super proton synchrotron is the blue uh, circle here. And that's from the 70s. And some of the work that was carried out in, in this accelerator led to the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1984, if I recall correctly. Um, and so this was in part uh, for the discovery of the vector bosons, which we could talk about later if you're interested. So then uh, we're going to focus today on the Large Hadron Collider. So that's the bigger circle over here. And the Large Hadron Collider was actually initially built. The tunnel was built for the Large Electron Positron Collider, which operated in the 90s, the 90s and 2000s. Um, and this was a collider that uh, had electrons in collision with anti-electrons. Then it was, let's say, repurposed for proton collisions mainly at the LHC, uh, which is not what we're doing right now. So we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, so perhaps we can take a second and show you um, an animation here. We have um, a mural that I can show you. And this should be able to give you an idea of the area of where we are now and also where we have several detectors, right? So we have the LHC that you saw in that picture. And I'll try to give you a bit of context of uh, where we are and what the area is like. So this here is the airport. And if you travel to Geneva and you fly here, this is where you would uh, where you would land. And then you can actually travel to you can travel to CERN just using a tram. There's a, a tram that gets you to CERN, which is just here. So this is where our uh, animation will start. So we're going to show you the process by which we inject protons into the LHC and then take them to collisions. And what I want you to take away from this is that there are several stages. So you can see here that there's a first circle, and that's the proton synchrotron. Then it goes into this larger circle. That's the SPS, or the super proton synchrotron. And then 
at each stage, the particles gain more energy and then they are injected into the LHC. So you can see also as the scale of the LHC. So the, the LHC is um, 27, around, around 27 kilometers in circumference. And so the, the main CERN site is down here, and this is where we have one detector called Atlas. But then at the very top, you can see that there are some collisions happening, hopefully. And that is where the CMS detector is. And this is where we are right now. This is very close to the town, or it's actually in the town of Sessi in France. Um, so hopefully this gives you an idea of uh, the scale and sort of the area where we are, um, just very much in the in the area of Geneva. So I I don't know if this would be a good time to check with check in with Sonia and see uh, where they are. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, this is a technical check. Okay, um, I think I, I could add just one thing to what you were you were uh, uh, describing because you were pointing uh, uh, the site of CMS. And as uh, we said before, today yes, there is physics. We cannot enter the experimental cavern. But we have a model of the experiment. So maybe we can have just a quick look, uh, and then you will have slides, uh, and uh, uh, Tunde and uh, Andres, uh, they will describe much better the detector. But however, as you see, is a sort of sleeping uh, cylinder, I would say. And uh, maybe I will try if you can catch the light. The light that you have here basically is the the accelerator entering uh, inside uh, uh, the detector, okay? So you see the point, uh, the lighting point. Uh, this is the middle because you have uh, the, 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 the stick continuous, the LHC continuous inside the detector. And then as you see, all around the detector, you wrap, this, uh, all around the beam pipe, sorry, you wrap the detector. And in fact, you start to have a different kind of uh, detectors. Uh, I can uh, show you the lights, some lighting parts, as you see. I can continue, you see. And then we have uh, the magnet here, OK? And then uh, at the very end, we have uh, the muon system, which is this one, OK? So basically, the idea is that you have the two beams, you have the ring, you have the two beams coming and the crossing in a specific point, which is CMS, and then you build around your camera to take, let's say, pictures of what happens from the, from the collision. Um, I know that there are really very nice slides that uh, can uh, show much better this. So. If Andres and Tunde, they, they allow me, I would like to enter the experimental area. And then as we have a, a break in the connection later, I will lead them to continue on this topic. So we have uh, some people here. I will explain to you how we have to access the experimental area. We are currently on surface in CC in France. And uh, to enter the experimental area, uh, area I have to use these uh, uh, doors. These are uh, doors for people. It's not for material. I will show you the doors for material. We have we have to we are submitted to three checks. One check is uh, to verify, let's say, that we are human. So you have we have a certain range. The system is. Uh, uh, verifying in a certain range the weight of the person, of course, and uh, luckily we do not see our weight, at least for me. <laughs> uh, and uh, we have to step inside this, maybe we can see there is a, a square with the uh, yellow dots, as you see here. We step inside this square and uh, we wait that the system checks that we are in in, a, in the, um, let's say, in the proper way. Then we cannot enter with the material and, for example, also personal material as backpacks because there is a check. There are infrared beams uh, which are uh, checking that we enter with nothing, basically. 
And the third check, which is the most important, is also the one which identifies us, is the biometrical check. So we check the iris. The machine is this one. You will see me entering uh, then this one, okay? I will do the reading of my iris. So of course, this uh, information is stored in the same database, so I will be recognized. Uh, how I ask to enter? I use my personal dosimeter, is this one. Uh, I don't know if you know, a dosimeter basically is an object that, that you wear and uh, uh, on, your, on your, your body. And basically the dose of radiation you receive is also the dose which is measure, measured by this object. And then we have machines that we have to, uh, where we check uh, the absorbed dose by this dosimeter. So this is my personal one. I will budge in this uh, place and then I will, you will see the doors opening. So I think I'm ready to enter. So I start. The system had told me that I did badly, you see? So it's a very specific system. Let's try again. Yes. I was stepping too calmly. So this is why the system didn't uh, receive the, the good uh, uh, information about uh, stepping in. Now I will wait. I have to say I'm not alone. Uh, there is Noemi with me. Then uh, later she will show herself too. Um, and she, I say, she's the wizard. Uh, you see also Noemi, she was caught. <laughs> I was just saying that she's a wizard because usually she can enter with the camera inside the, this uh, nasty door. But now, hey, also she got a problem. Let's see now. We have some problem entering uh, with the door. You know, the check is very important. Maybe I can continue saying that uh, we have, don't have only this door here. We have also other doors, a similar check underground. And uh, the, the, let's say that what changes is the color depending how you approach to the experimental area. These are green, all greens are on surface, but then, but then you have doors also yellow and red. Now, as you see, if you follow me, we have other doors for people here. These, of course, because there are many workers here, as uh, we will have, I think, the time to say, not only physicists, but engineers, as Tunde, and also technicians, as you have seen. So we need really to, 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 to have many entrances. And these blue doors that you see here, this is for material. Basically, when you want to bring material inside here, what you need to do is uh, to go on the other side, which is uh, the external part, you put your material inside the, because there are two doors here. So there is a space in, in, in the middle of two doors. Then you budge through the, the green doors and then you reopen the doors from this side, from this, uh, with this key. So this is uh, the thing in case, uh, and I hope that you will come here to visit us, uh, consider, uh, we cannot ask you to give, uh, give us uh, your uh, uh, biometrical information. So there is only one way we can bypass the green doors is uh, to treat you, and I uh, please accept my apologies, to treat you as material. So you will be invited to go through the blue doors. The only thing that we, we will not leave you inside, uh, in the middle of the, uh, the, the two doors. We will open them in one shot so you can immediately enter and wear a nice orange helmet. I'm waiting for the, the elevator. Now it's almost here. You see now this is the level zero is uh, uh, the surface. Uh, you can see the meters, the deepness. Now we enter inside, I will show you uh, how we number the, the, the floors and then I will leave the floor to my colleagues. So we enter inside here.
you see is a big elevator fits almost uh, 30 people and then you can see here we have a different buttons so zero for the surface so minus one for minus 80 meters minus two minus 90 meters minus three minus 100 meters and maybe it's nice uh, to see we still have some uh, uh, let's say souvenir, I don't know if uh, of the COVID time, because you can see the steps when we had to do the visit only with few people. Now, uh, we will leave you to have a look when we go down, I push the button and I, I think that uh, Andres and Tunde, we will have to, uh, we, I will be interrupted. We go to minus two, which is about minus 90. Can you take the floor there? Of course. Thank you so much, Sonia. Thank you. So I think this is a good uh, opportunity to talk about uh, one thing that we got uh, several questions about. So we had several questions about why are most of the facilities underground? And there are several reasons you might think that uh, we need to have the facilities underground. But uh, one thing that, that I would point out is that we have we have accelerators that have operated basically on the surface. So before the Large Hadron Collider, the most powerful Hadron Collider, so let's say proton, in this case, it was proton anti-proton collider was the Tevatron. And the Tevatron operated in Fermilab uh, that's about 45 minutes from Chicago, Illinois in the US. Um, it operated from the 90s uh, to around the 2000s. Uh, I don't recall exactly the dates, but let's say 90s, 90s to 2000s. And it's basically built on the surface. We, it, it's covered in, you know, it, it's covered. So it's not exposed, let's say, but it's basically on the surface. So the main reason why most, most things are underground here at CERN is very practical. So um, in France, we're So the the main reason is that in France, where most of the ring is uh, located, uh, so let me try to show you here the border between France and Switzerland. So Switzerland is towards the side of the lake, and then France is closer to the camera point of view. So the yellow circle, of course, represents the LHC, and most of the ring is on the French side. It just so happens that in France, if you buy a property, if you buy land and you're going to buy a house, basically you own it down to about 50 meters or so. I don't know the exact number, but more or less this, more or less this. And below yeah. that, it belongs to the state. So France was able to, let's say, donate the underground areas uh, to CERN. And that's one of the main reasons. And that way we did, CERN didn't have to buy all the land to build the LHC tunnel. Um, so we also should talk about the detector, but it might be good to switch to Sonia at this point. Yeah. Yes, if you allow me just to, to, to add, there is also uh, another reason, let's say, uh, is that basically uh, because we have the PS, the proton synchrotron, which is uh, inside the building, the on surface, uh, inside the marine site, as you pointed out before. And then we have the SPS, the super proton synchrotron, which is already minus 40 meters underground already, because uh, basically the moment you go outside the, the site where we work, uh, there are roads and buildings. So you need to build a ring you cannot affect the life of people outside and you want to protect also your object. So this is why we were going underground. And for the LHC, it's even worse because being 27 kilometers means that basically, as you have seen from, from the map, there are many, um, many small villages or small towns. And this is also an historical place uh, okay, mm, there were uh, since uh, I would say the Roman times, but also later. So there are houses, so there are roads, and uh, we found uh, a nice, uh, let's say, in um, a suitable layer of rocks where to put the 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 accelerator, more or less at minus ninety, uh, minus uh, one hundred meters. This is uh, uh, the reason why minus one hundred meters. And as Anders said before, why going down because of the land 
which uh, belongs uh, to, to France. Now, coming here, why I'm here? I'm outside the, the, the elevator. I can show you just, uh, okay, I'm in minus two, uh, which is minus 87.9, almost minus 90 meters. And uh, I'm in what we call the safety, the safety area. What is this? Uh, I'm underground. There are uh, fire doors uh, on both sides, uh, but um, this place uh, is safe. And in principle, if there is uh, an evacuation alarm, this is the place where we can stay and wait uh, for the fire brigade uh, if we cannot uh, uh, evacuate uh, using the elevator. This is a very important thing. Uh, evacuation must be done only using the elevator. Sorry, just a moment. So, Sonia, do you mind if I yes. just quickly answer very quickly a few questions? Yes. Um, so there's a question about how and where the CERN collect the raw materials, like the proton, and how is it uh, injected or inserted in the, into the collider? So the fundamentally, the proton is just taken from a hydrogen bottle. If you take hydrogen and you remove the electrons that's orbiting in the hydrogen atom, you end up with a proton. So that's where, where the protons come from that we use for the LHC. At the moment, we're not colliding protons, but again, I'll, I'll talk about that later. Um, now, the, the way that they're injected into the LHC is quite complicated. You kind of saw from the animation we had here that there's multiple stages. So I can talk about that later, but I just wanted to quickly answer that. And so there's another question that I can quickly answer. So the question is, what is the speed of the protons um, in the LHC tunnel? And the way that I like to answer that is I, you know, you, you from, hopefully are familiar with the speed of light. The speed of light is very, very, very quick. Uh, it, in fact, it's 299,792,458 meters per second in vacuum. And if you subtract three meters per second from that number, you get the speed of the protons around the LHC. So, uh, Sonia, maybe back to you. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, of course, because protons they have a mass. So they cannot go at the speed of the light in the vacuum. <laughs> this is why, but they are very close. And just to say that uh, starting from the PS, we are already enough close. We improved them this speed, but basically what we we act now, we, we should need the, the, the equation E equal MC square, but maybe adding also another term. And uh, I don't know now the, the level of all students, but uh, some of them, they should know that there is also uh, a part related to the, let's say, kinetic energy or momentum. And so this is uh, the part that we are, uh, we increase with the speed and then we increase the part of the mass. So this is what we are doing basically all along the, the, the detector, because at a certain point you cannot, you cannot over go more than uh, the speed of the light in the vacuum as the protons or the ion, be, uh, the, uh, ion uh, the lead ions that we are colliding now, they have mass. Coming back to this, I was saying before the group, because you see, we have groups visiting the site. So uh, this place, why is safe and why we have to, um, to evacuate using the elevator and not the stairs, because we have also the stairs, is because this place is overpressurized. This means that basically, if there is any uh, smoke fire and so smoke or gas leakage outside this uh, uh, room, nothing can enter here. And uh, the elevator itself is protected uh, with this system. So it means it's safe to use the elevator. Uh, maybe you can, uh, uh, you can notice this is uh, something which is uh, different from the daily life where usually when there is a fire in a building, you are asked not to use the elevator, but use the stairs. Here, just for these sites at minus 100 meters is uh, the other way around. Of course, when you wait here, uh, we have many systems as you, as you see uh, that uh, we can use uh, to con be connected with the fire brigade, even if they know exactly what is happening. We can also uh, start an evacuation alarm uh, all guides, uh, people working here, they are trained to use uh, a, um, an extinguisher. We are all uh, first aiders. So you see, uh, we put on place, I would say, all the things uh, to make uh, working inside as safe 
as possible. Um, and I will come back again on this uh, aspect because safety is the first thing that we have to pay attention when we work in an experimental place. And then we do our work as physicists or engineers or technicians. Now I enter because I think it's important. Then I, uh, Andres and Tunde, I will give you the, the, the floor. When I enter, I'm entering the counting room because it's very noisy, this counting room. So it's uh, I will uh, show you uh, uh, what is around, but I will talk about not too much there because it's really annoying. You will not uh, uh, listen to this noise, but for, uh, for us here, it's really annoying. So as you see here, uh, I show you that uh, I'm really at minus 90. Uh, I will ask Noemi to show the, the ceiling of this uh, shaft. I don't know if you can see this, uh, uh, gray square on the top. But this is uh, where I was just a few minutes ago. And then uh, we have this shaft uh, from which we can bring up and down material from uh, uh, the surface to the experimental cavern or the other way around. Uh, now, how it happens this? Uh, it happens because if uh, Noemi, I will wait for Noemi, showing you the minus 100 level, which is just below. You should see a, a, a black floor with some strips, uh, yellow and black, and also a structure in uh, yellow. And uh, this is, uh, this is uh, basically the minus 100 level. And there is also a wall that I guess you could, uh, you could see is a wall uh, made of a uh, block of concrete uh, this wall is uh, each each year is built, <laughs> and built and rebuilt. Why? Because uh, each year we have uh, what we call a short shutdown. Uh, short shutdown means that we stop the beam. We can enter the cavern and we can make some checks uh, on the detector, and we remove this wall. So basically. This wall is not there, will be not there be from, uh, let's say, December to uh, this year, December to um, end of, I don't know, March, something like that. But this is more or less, more or less are three months. And then, okay, what we do, basically, these, uh, these uh, blocks, they are removed, and we can, we can bring a material, we can enter the cavern from here. So this is a place where we can enter the experimental cavern. Um, I didn't uh, show you the map uh, of the, 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 te the detector, but maybe I can do with my hands. So it's uh, quite nice. I know that there are nice slides, but basically, if you see my position, we have uh, two caverns, okay, as my hands. One cavern, which is uh, it's very long and thin, which is called uh, the service cavern. I'm in the middle of the service cavern, okay? And I will go from here back towards the end of this cavern on my back. And then uh, in parallel, we have another cavern, which is a uh, larger, but shorter, and this is in that side is the cavern of the detector, okay? So you understand immediately that this wall I was talking about is connecting the two caverns. It's not the only, the, the only place where you have get the connection, but it's one of the two. And what is nice to know is that between the two caverns, uh, you, you, you have a wall which is uh, seven meters uh, of concrete th thick. So these, uh, these, uh, these blocks, uh, when you remove them, you have a corridor which is uh, seven meters long, which brings you from uh, the service cavern to the experimental cavern. Why this uh, thickness uh, to protect people working here during the collision on the other side? Um, the detector, but I think that, uh, okay, the, my colleague, they will talk about this. Uh, the detector is in the cavern here. We have some pictures, uh, but maybe I can go back if uh, in, in case later about this. I will enter now the counting uh, room. There is this room at this level. There is another one to the, to the, uh, to the level at minus 80 and uh, contains the electronics. I will just say that as you can imagine, 
you have your camera and then you need the electronics uh, to read the information and to uh, to filter the information to reconstruct the information so you, all the electronics uh, that you get in these two rooms uh, is the part of what we call the level one trigger where trigger stays for uh, starting the, the data acquisition, but also to filter the information because the data, and I know that Tunde has many things to say about this, the data we collect inside are really a huge amount. We cannot store them. Then this is not the only story because this is the level one. And then we have another farm of computers on surface and they are called the high level trigger and you continue to make this filtering, okay? So now when we go inside, uh, you will get a special thing because the visitors have you, you have seen, they are not allowed to go in between the corridors, we can. So you will see what, what we have in between the corridors. You will see many cables, you will see many optical fibers, just pay attention at the cabling. At the very end, I will give you a, my personal comment about this. All right, thank you, Sonia. So I very quickly wanted to take an opportunity to answer a few questions from the Q&A. Uh, so I'll try to be very brief, but uh, there's a question about the dosimeter that we, the personal dos dosimeter we wear, and whether it's an optical fiber dosimeter. Uh, I'm not an expert on this, but uh, the dosimeters that we wear have, they have a TLD and an ionization chamber, so it's not exactly uh, the same. Um, so uh, there's a question about accelerators with a circumference uh, less than the LHC circumference and whether we use them for the same purpose. I mentioned the Tevatron earlier at Fermilab, and that's a good example. It, we use, uh, you know, we do, we did the same kind of science and same kind of research at the Tevatron. That's where we discovered the top quark, which I can talk about later if you're interested. Uh, so indeed, uh, the Tevatron, I think, if I recall correctly, is 6.28 miles in circumference. I don't, I'm not sure how much in kilometers that is, but it's a, it's two pi. That's that much I remember. Uh, there's another question about protons. Um, when they collide, it can result in a thermonuclear reaction. Um, I the, so when the protons interact, the actual interaction is very complicated. I don't know if I would characterize it as thermonuclear. We don't have fusion, if that's what you mean. Um, but the the interaction between the protons is indeed very uh, complicated and it's difficult to um, to model or to describe uh, mathematically. But what I was going to say is that the energy exchanged between two individual protons is actually not as much as you might think. So it's comparable to a butterfly that is just, you know, flapping its wings and flying. However, if you take all of the protons that are circulating at basically the speed of light around the LHC tunnel, then the energy stored or the energy that they carry, the kinetic energy, is comparable to a high-speed train. Um, so let me uh, pause on the questions for now, and maybe let's have a look at uh, the service cavern where Sonia is. And you can see some uh, great cable management here. I think um, there's a lot of work that needs to happen and just in, in cabling this entire detector. And um, there's so much going on, but in this room, as Sonia was saying, we have mostly low voltage and high voltage power supplies. We have fiber optics coming from the detector. They're pointing out right now, these are PLCs or programmable logic controllers. And these are uh, keeping track of the conditions of the detector that can be temperature, that can be humidity. And they're making sure that if there is for example, a loss in the in the dry air that's supplied uh, and the humidity starts going up that unattended the the let's say the system can put the detector in a safe state. So here we see more power supplies. If you notice, th this is one of my favorite racks. This is this is um, maintained by some of my colleagues, and uh, it it looks very complicated, and it's because it is. Um, I I know for a fact that they've had to adjust the timing at times and that involves connecting an extra length of cable to adjust a new a few nanometers in the timing so um, I, I think um i can uh, say a little about this uh, connection we are seeing here because these machines uh what are managed by my department the dark they are data acquisition systems uh, we have electronics here uh, we have detector uh, 
system uh, and the, some nodes that manage detector safety system here. And then in this place, we have um, more than 2,000 nodes um, that manage the CMS operations, right from the detector down to the export of data and to our storage. And then um, we have the fiber up, up, uh, links we have here. Uh, they operate at a speed that is so uh, very fast. Uh, we have about 200 gigabits. They transport data at that very high speed. Now, let me explain that, uh, that speed rate, 200 gigabits. Uh, normal domestic um, transfer rate, internet speed at home, we have uh, in Europe here, we have uh, around 100 mega megabits. 100 megabits in Europe here. Uh, maybe in, in, in anywhere in the part of the world, maybe in US, we have something like 215. That is the maximum, around 250. In Africa, you, we have less than 60. But in CMS, we transport data at the rate of 200 gigabits. That is 2,000 times faster than what we have at domestic uh, domestic home that we even consider so very super fast, even in our offices. And we are still not, um, we are not stopping here because uh, we are still trying to increase the capacity to transport uh, this data at a faster rate. So that is what we have here. Then Sonia, I think you can show us, uh, there are some rack with um, um, uh, orange stripe. Can you show us some, ripe, uh, some rack with uh, orange stripe? Yes. This one. Yes, yes. Uh, we have some ra uh, racks. Some of these racks are, that are marked with orange stripes. Uh, we have some that are not marked with orange stripes. But this one, it indicates that um, in case there is any uh, challenge, uh, any problem, and there is a, a power cut, we have a global power cut where we cut off the power from the canteen room. These racks still retain power. They are uninterrupted. So we still have power. The equipment inside the rack still have power because of the, uh, the specific function they perform. So if the power is cut off from the old canteen room, all the systems and the nodes we have inside the rack still retain power. So we have to, uh, on top of that rack, we have uh, a local power cord where you, we can heat that we cut off the, the power uh, from them. Uh, I think, Address, do you have more to say about this? Yeah, maybe just a word about okay. what we are looking at now, or or maybe Sonia, you yes. want to add a word? And I just oh no, first you say the technical. This is uh, for uh, the the let's say the resistive plates uh, cabling. This is our uh, just um, let's say not optical fibers. Uh, but as I have my personal comment here, if you want to add uh, something uh, technical, I would just say very quickly. Then uh, after you, the personal comment. Well, just very quickly, yes, yeah. you said these are high voltage cables for one of the muon detectors at CMS, the resistive uh, plate chambers, and these carry very high voltages. So each of these cables is carrying a handful of kilovolts, right? So, you know, something like 5000 volts each. So go ahead, Sonia. Yes, OK, so you see, um, just have a look to you have already seen how the cables, uh, all the cable, cables and optical fiber, they are arranged in the other racks. But uh, this wall to me, uh, as a, to me is a special meaning, not, not because I was working on this, but I, I did, uh, let's say, in my career, many, many things, uh, um, data analysis, uh, building uh, silicon uh, detectors, uh, uh, clean rooms works, and also cabling with the optical fibers. So I know what does it mean uh, to make a cabling. And when I see each time this wall, to me is a sort of summary of what a part uh, or the behavior, or I don't know, a skill that uh, whoever is uh, is cabling, a physicist, uh, at least to me, should have, which is really to uh, stay focused on the job and uh, be careful on the length of the cable, as uh, Andres was saying, because this means that you can have delay, and you don't want delay. And then, of course, you have to pay attention also to the mechanical characteristic of the cabling. Uh, what does it mean? That you cannot stretch cables, so you cannot force connectors, otherwise uh, nothing will work. You can break uh, uh, the inner part of the cable. So there is uh, so much inside uh, this activity of cabling uh, and uh, I'm, I would like also to mention how you cable. So 
the, the mapping you want to do with the, each cable and the connectors you have on the panels. So it's really summarizing a part of the activity of a physicist. And you know what, even if you could think that this is boring because you are doing for days the same thing, I can tell you, believe me, that the moment you have finished your to cable your rack, and you push the, the, the on button, so you switch on the button and everything work, works, you are really proud of your job. You say, okay, I did my job. So really take this uh, wall as a, a metaphorical part of the skills of a physicist. I go now down, I leave the floor to you. We we'll see in the okay. red door. All right, thank you, Sonia. Um, in fact, I think we can hand it over to you. I'll just um, just mention that it's uh, now noon, so we have about thirty more minutes to go. Just to give you yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. So I go very fast now. I have two things uh, to to do, which are left here. One is to to say a few things about this red door, and then uh, to let you experience with me the magnetic field that we feel outside of the experimental cavern because we are almost at the end of the tour. So uh, first of all, this red door. Uh, if I'm here now with Noemi and if visitors, uh, they were able to come and visit uh, uh, this uh, place uh, before. And if you want to come here to, uh, to, to visit CMS, uh, you should know that you can come any time along the, the, uh, the year. This is not the case for the other three experiments. Uh, I know that you will think that I'm advertising CMS, but uh, this is the truth. This is objective, is a fact. So basically, only CMS allows people to uh, go underground during uh, the, collisions, uh, the collisions. Why? It's because of this red door. Why? Because uh, I don't know if uh, maybe in the meanwhile, I'm, I'm talking, uh, I don't know, I can show a map here, but uh, I guess that also, okay, there is also uh, as a slide. So just to consider that the slide should be, uh, should be turned 90 degree uh, clockwise to be in the position I am. But basically what you can see here, is that you have the two caverns I was talking about, the longest one, which is uh, the service cavern, and the shortest one, which is the, this, uh, the experimental cavern. You see then uh, this uh, path, this is uh, the LHC, okay? The beam pipe of LHC. Now, the red door is exactly at this point. I told you that uh, I was moving from the elevator to the, the end of the cavern. So we are here, and this is the red door. You see that if I could open this red door, I have a corridor which brings me to the LHC tunnel. Um, but there is also a second corridor which brings to a second elevator, okay? Um, basically, the fact that we reach the LHC is not really important because the door is sealed. So it's not a, here to uh, be used to reach the LHC. You enter the LHC from other other uh, entries, but is important for this uh, second elevator. So is a second, as you can see, a second escape path. Uh, this means that if we cannot go back from the the the, the path that I was using to come here, we can open this door that now is sealed and we can reach the other elevator. Uh, the fact that distinguish CMS from the other experiment is that they have also, of course, a second escape path. But this second escape path uh, ask people to go through the experimental cavern. Um, you can imagine there is an evacuation alarm. There is no beam at all because everything is switched off, but there is a certain residual radioactivity background in the cavern, in the experimental cavern. And that uh, this is not something that is uh, advised for visitors, not because it's dangerous, but just because, uh, um, okay, let's say, we don't want that some people uh, could imagine that, that they could be uh, injured by this, okay? So CERN decided that if uh, the second escape path is not on the side of the service cavern, we cannot uh, we cannot uh, allow people to go to go here. 
Now, um, let's go to here. So I'm almost at the end of my tour. I will show you a detector, qualitative and quantitative. Many of you, I guess, uh, will start to laugh, but this is a detector. And uh, you know, uh, as I told you, of course, uh, I did uh, in my life many calculations, a lot of math, but I still think that physics uh, is what you can observe and you can enjoy. And this is also to say that even people who don't want to become a technician, technicians of particle physics, as I am or my colleagues are, uh, can still enjoy physics. So this is a chain, uh, you see, clips is not magnetized. Now we use it, this as a detector of the magnetic field to see, to approach the cavern, the experimental cavern. Please have a look to this uh, clip here. And you will see that we start to bend. Okay, you see? Okay, you can see, you see when I'm going and maybe even in that way, is even, and if you don't believe me, I can do this, which is also okay. Oh. You see? So now, what is the situation in this corner? Now, uh, on, on this back, we have the, the door that in case you, I was uh, allowed to enter, I would uh, use this door, which works exactly as the green one. And I enter, there's a corridor, other, let's say a few meters. And uh, we reach the, on the, on the left, and we reach the door to enter the experimental cavern. But as you see, now we cannot, everything is closed. There is physics. So we had to stick in this corner. Uh, now, this corner where uh, there is my 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 chain, uh, basically, if I could make it transparent, uh, you would see this, okay? Which is the detector, the end part of the detector, the end cap of the detector, and then uh, here inside uh, there is one beam pipe entering the detector. Now, inside the detector, in the central part, uh, the magnetic field, uh, the intensity is a three point eight tesla. In this point is a uh, 0.5 millitesla, something like that. So you see, it's really dropping down, but still we can have effects on this. And now I will show you, I will play with you. Please forget the questions, but I will tell you that this can be also a quantitative detector. Now, this wall is not, is not magnet, uh, magnetic, but the screws they are. So we start with a simple pendulum. You see, I can tell you that people enjoy a lot, me too, <laughs> to have this pendulum doing this. And now, okay, I will uh, tell you about some uh, stories that happened to me just uh, when I was pe pe with people. Okay, basically once it happened suddenly that these clips attach like that, okay? And then, Instead of saying, ah, okay, what a mess, I started to play with this. This is my magnetic swing. Now, believe me, if I push, you see, I'm pushing down the, the chain, but believe me that I can feel the chain pushing me up when I'm doing this, okay? And then why this can be transformed in a, in a, in a quantitative detector? Because once I wanted to do this and the chain dropped down, I repeated the three times this because I thought that it was my fault, it was not. So I understood that the weight of the chain was too much. So the magnetic field here was not enough. So I removed some clips and I was able to do the same exercise, okay? But then I went to the control room to ask people something because it was strange. My chain was always the same and I couldn't manage to do the swing. And I, will, I went to the chief leader asking, um, 
if there was something about the, the, the magnetic field. And I remember that this guy at the very beginning was not paying too much attention to me because he was working. And at a certain point when I said, but what is going on with the magnetic field? He, he was looking at me and suddenly asked me, how do you know about this? And I said, yes, I know because I, my chain doesn't work. And uh, he told me that there was a problem with the magnetic field. And so they had to lower the level of the magnetic field. So imagine if I could uh, calibrate this uh, chain, which means uh, to associate an amount of magnetic field with each clip, I could really have an, a rough idea of what is the magnetic field inside. I could start now just to add clips until this drops down, but I don't have the time, unfortunately. So I had to move to another thing. Only this one. Okay. Um, I have many things to play here, but I will show you just this one. You see, I have other clips. They are magnetized. So I was looking for my chain, but the chain was not here. And at a certain point, you can imagine all these clips went on the floor. And uh, you, I will show you what I saw at that moment was this one. Can you see them? And also here, look, it's not just on the, it's not just on the, on the floor, this is metallic. And now you see they are steady. I can try to move them just making some wind, but I cannot. But if I take a clip, you see this one, you see, I can move them, which is uh, through the magnetic uh, force, you see? And can do also here. And somebody then, uh, when I was doing this, I was uh, suggesting me to collect the clips like that. And of course I accepted that because this is a clever way to collect. And then uh, this person told me, okay, yes, now you have this. Can I, can I do the same on the other side? But as I was moving on the other side, you see, everything drops. And if you see, this means that basically the magnetic field in this part is dropping. So this is another way to not to making a quantitative measurement, but to make a qualitative measurement of the of the magnetic field. So now I take back my clips, and as there are also other visitors here, I will leave them the floor to enjoy. I cannot take the clips with the, the other the other one. And okay, I I see you. Okay, thank you, Sonia. So uh, yes. Tunde had another. I see you later. Thank you. So Tunde, you wanted to add a comment, right? Yes, yes I, I think about the um, the magnetic field, the impact in the service cabin. Uh, we should not forget that there is a seven meter wall in between the uh, the uh, detector and the service cabin. And sometimes when we also go to service cabin to uh, interact with our machines and our nodes, when you open the rack, uh, you have to be very careful because the magnetic field can push back the rack. It's so powerful that uh, it can, it depends on the directions and the location of the racks. It can then close or open the racks on its own. And uh, sometimes also um, uh, there are some laptops and some phones that if you take it to the service cabin, um, while you are working on your laptops, uh, magnetic feed can interact with your laptops and then cause your system to sleep. Your laptop will sleep or your phone will sleep because it sends a message to your screen that, uh, to your system that your screen is closed. And while you are still operating your laptop or your phones, it goes sleep because of the effect of the, uh, of the magnetic feed. And sometimes when we want to take our notes from the rack, uh, if care is not taken, it sticks to the, 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 the body of the rack because of the effect of this uh, magnetic feed. And this one is so excite, uh, excited because uh, sometimes there are some uh, electromagnetic uh, watch that if you take inside the service cabin, it will slow down the frequency of that watch, sometimes by 10 minutes. So you discover that when you are back to the surface level, 
your watch is 10 minutes late. This is the very good effect of the magnetic feed. So Andres, I think um, you can tell us more. Yes. Yes, I have a story about this coming up uh, just a moment uh, about uh, it was not me. It happens to me because uh, when I'm underground, uh, I, I really uh, I am always late because the time is uh, is uh, <laughs> flowing in another way. But I remember a colleague of mine uh, managing, uh, she was guiding uh, a, um, a visit uh, and she had a mechanical watch, as you were saying, uh, and uh, she was looking the time uh, to be of course, on time for the surface, but then she experienced exact, exactly this delay, and uh, she was not aware that uh, she the, that his uh, her watch were, was man magnetized, and so she was late. So it's exactly the effect you were saying, uh, and also sometimes the mobile phones they, they focus. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Sonia. So I wanted to quickly just I want to start talking about the de the detector itself. But maybe we can start with the magnet, right? So we've talked about the magnet and there have been several questions about it. So the magnet is, in principle, it is an electromagnet, but it's a superconducting solenoid. So in this picture, you can see the magnet. Uh, it's a cylinder that's six meters in inner diameter. Hopefully you can see my mouse. I'm just um, showing it here. And the superconducting solenoid that we have at CMS, uh, we have to cool it down to cryogenic temperatures, and we use a material called niobium titanium, which is superconducting. So at those temperatures, we can inject a lot of current into our magnet. By a lot of current, I mean about 18,000 amperes of current, in fact, a little bit over that. And when we do that, the magnet will generate inside of the magnet volume 3.8 Tesla. Um, so just for context, where Sonia was um, showing you the effect of the magnetic field, already the magnetic field, and as, as Tunda said, there's a seven meter thick reinforced concrete wall separating the detector and where Sonia was. So already for three, from 3.8 Tesla, it will be down to a handful of milli Tesla. And in comparison, the Earth's magnetic field is about 50 micro Tesla or so. And so this is hopefully answering two questions, what's, uh, what type of magnet it is, and also how we shield. There was a question about how we shield the magnetic field. The answer is that the magnet itself is designed to be pretty constrained. So the magnetic field is uh, drops ver quite dramatically as you move away from the detector, already where Sonia is at. It's noticeable, of course, very noticeable, but it's perfectly safe. Um, so. Uh, uh, unless yes. I forget, I think it, it would be good uh, to to show the the audience uh, the the size, the physical size of the of the uh, yes, actually. Detector. So, Sultan, yes. perhaps we can quickly uh, show the detector, and and you can demonstrate. Yes, this is the physical size of the detector. Andres, you can continue to ex explain. Sure. Yeah, maybe this is a, a good opportunity to show you guys. So this is a cross section of the detector. So if you could imagine the particles will be moving into this uh, banner or into this image, and they would collide at the center. So starting from the center, we have, of course, the, pro the protons or the particles moving inside of what we call the beam pipe, which is at a very strong vacuum. And around the beam pipe, we have the first layer of detectors, and those are silicon-based detectors. We have two types of detectors. One uses uh, silicon pixel detectors, similar to a camera, a photo camera or a video camera. And we also have um, a strip detector, which is also using silicon. So those detectors are very lightweight, and we use them to measure the trajectory of the particles. Um, and then around that, we have two types of calorimeter. So calorimeters are very different. They're very dense, they're very heavy, and the approach there is to slow down and stop the particles. And each of the layers is measuring a different type of particle. We have an electromagnetic calorimeter that focuses on electrons and photons, and then we have a hadronic calorimeter that is really measuring particles that are makes, made of quarks and gluons. Uh, this is, of course, the proton and the neutron, but also many other particles that are produced in these collisions are also uh, made up of quarks and gluons. So around that, we have, again, the magnet. So our calorimetry and our uh, 
tracking, our silicon tracking, fits all inside of the magnet. And you can hopefully see that uh, in the image uh, that we're projecting um, of the area here, there is a sort of a gap between, there's a, a large disk and then there's a gap and there, there's a bigger gap around that. So the outermost layer before that gap, so the silver ring that you see, uh, that corresponds to the magnet. And then um, outside of that gap is the muon systems. And there's several muon systems. In fact, we have four muon systems, um, but they're all based on gas detector technology. So we're using gases um, that will ionize when a muon goes through and then we can collect a signal from those modules. So that's a short, uh, let's say, version of our detector. There's a lot more detail that I would go, like to get into, but I will also want to mention, I, I think Sonia has a comment about this. Um, so our detector is very, very heavy. It's very dense. And, and part of the reason is because in the muon system, all of these sections that are in red are actually made of stainless steel. The reason for that is that most of the magnetic field is produced inside of the volume of the magnet, of inside of those six meters in inner diameter. So outside, there wouldn't be normally much magnetic field, but it gets reinforced by the addition of all this steel. And we can actually produce about two Tesla in this, what we call the return yoke. Um, and this is so that the muons also bend when they exit the magnet. Um, and so that makes the detector very, very heavy. In total, the detector is about 14,000 tons, uh, which is one way to think about it is it's, it's that it's twice as heavy as the Eiffel Tower. It's one figure that we use very often. Um, but if Sonia is is there, maybe she, I, I know she yes, has I'm a here. comment. Go ahead. <laughs> Yes, okay. No, I have other comparisons. One comparison, which is, uh, let's say, uh, more serious, is uh, that a city car is more or less uh, one, one ton. So if you think about uh, 14,000 city cars, one on the top of the other, so you can uh, get the feeling uh, of the weight of this detector. And, uh, okay, I... I I uh, take the advantage uh, to make a comparison with uh, the other uh, scientific competitors uh, we have here, which is uh, which is the detector Atlas detector, uh, because of course uh, we have collaboration. We collect data, but then we compare data, and then when we are sure that the data they can be uh, merged, we merge data to 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 get more statistics. So. Uh, more uh, to, to increase the precision on, on the measurements. Uh, and so basically, well, what happens is that uh, um, between the two experiments, uh, if uh, you can imagine uh, if you have the cross-section of CMS, is a building of five floors. If you take uh, the same, the cross-section of Atlas is a building of nine floors. So it's much bigger. I would say that is a double in length because uh, uh, Atlas is 46 meters long and CMS is, uh, it depends what you consider, 21 or 25, 28. But however, the weight, uh, even if Atlas is so big, uh, the weight is just half of the weight of, uh, of CMS just because CMS is compact. And I have here, um, I, I tried to be educated by, by Tunde and I was asking because uh, I like to make a comparison with food. And, uh, okay, my comparison was not uh, the best. Uh, uh, he suggested me to use another one, which is the pounded yam that I have here on the phone, which is, uh, as far as I understand, I would like to try this one once um, with a very dense uh, part and a very light part. So even if you see much more um let's say that the, the dish here is uh, uh let's say full uh, the density of this one is less than the density of this one which is not full and this is, is exactly the comparison i would like to do with uh, atlas and cms for what concerned the the data ta uh, the, the data taking and uh, uh, the data interpretation and the reconstruction of course they have the same quality and we can merge the data um I know that somebody asked me to show so the high level. I don't know if I have just a few minutes to go around uh, the racks. 
Uh, is it possible, Andres uh, Tunde? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, so we enter inside. This is the high level. Uh, again, it's very, very noisy here. I know that you cannot uh, uh, manage this, but it's very noisy. So I will go around the racks and maybe you can make some uh, uh, description of the place, okay? Yeah, so in fact, there was a question in the Q&A about the trigger systems and where are they are located. Uh, so I will let Tunde talk about this a bit, but this is the second stage of the trigger system. So we have a sort of a level one, and then this is the high yes, level trigger. Yes, we have a level one trigger, uh, which uh, inter interact directly with a detector to collect the raw data. And don't forget that we have, uh, this collision happens about 40 million times, crossing rate, 40 million times. And everything we are seeing here happens per second. So we have the raw data that you can compare to uh, which might, might waterfall coming from the detectors because uh, the collision, each collision produce uh, millions of uh, splashes of uh, raw data and the, what the detector does is uh, to take snapshots of all these uh, particles. Then uh, when you take the snapshots of the particle which uh, more than 40 millions, uh, the level one trigger uh, collects these uh, raw particles and uh, filter them to take the interesting one. We call it interesting physics. So it filter these 40 million snapshots and um, take something like 100,000 out of the 40 millions. Uh, that is level one triggers. Then uh, it passes to the first stage of the dark systems, uh, which uh, assembles the, the interesting uh, data filtered by the level one triggers. It assembles the ones that are related together and to form uh, what we call an uh, event. Uh, event is a complete information of a detector about one uh, crossing point. So uh, after that, uh, it's, it's transported by our, uh, the optical links to the HLT, that is where Sonia is. We have the HLT nodes. Uh, this is the second level of, of, of filtrations. Uh, it takes uh, about 100,000 effects into these nodes here and to perform further filtrations, further, further selections, to take interesting out of the interesting, more, in, more interesting physics from the one that has been filtered uh, already. Then after that, uh, pass it to the grouping and building stage, the grouping and building stage to put all the, uh, the events together and um, have it stored. We have in, in this particular uh, compartment, we have another system, uh, we have the storage unit, we are the, the final, Data we we have that has been filtered are uh, stored, and um, we are looking at uh, Can I talk from off? yeah. Tunde. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, it was just to show the ventilation. Well, this no, is that, why <laughs> that place Can is super cool. This? Yeah, that place. You see. <laughs> That place is super cool. It's super cool. It's super cool there. So uh, at the uh, we at the at the end of the day, we have uh, about zero point zero zero three data retained. I'm talking of percentage. Zero point zero zero three percent percent of the data from the uh, detector retained in this place, and the rest ninety nine point nine nine seven percent is discarded. So these are exported to our IT where uh, the distribution is made to different data uh, center for physicists to do further analysis and experiment. Okay, Andres. Okay, thank and you so any... much. All right, so I and think you... Sonia is uh, returning um, back and we are now at the 12, uh, at the one thirty mark pretty much right now. Um, perhaps we could take a, a second uh, and, and try to answer a few questions. Um, so, uh, yes, Sonia, go ahead. There was there was one one question uh, for me. <laughs> Somebody was asking, uh, "What happens if you are treated as a as a material?" <laughs> was explicitly for me. In yeah, you want to go ahead? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's just to say that. Okay, of course, I was I was joking, but it's the only way we can uh, bypass, uh, in fact, the the system, and uh, this is useful. Now, just uh, to show, as I'm coming back, uh, and then uh, uh, I Sonia, can, can I can I just jump in really quickly? So, what Sonia means is that we have a door called the material access door, and yeah. this is where we take visitors through. We cannot take them yeah. through the normal normal entrance because it requires dosimeter. Um, 
and, and sorry, dosimeter, it and it the, requires the biometric uh, authentication. Exactly. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, there was a no. There was a question. In fact, I think uh, just after it was entered. Now here I'm in the control room, uh, just uh, to show you a little bit uh, very quickly. So basically, you have seen uh, the electronics, uh, and then okay, here are people standing to managing uh, with the data taking with all computers. Uh, and uh, you do your shift eight hours uh, in a row is uh, all the day. So three shifts per day. Uh, Noemi, she's uh, just showing uh, stable beams. As you see, ion physics uh, is not protons. And OK, uh, then, of course, we don't have time to show everything. Uh, these are some uh, event displays So what is happening inside the detector. Uh, <clears throat> which uh, we have uh, a cross section and we have a longitudinal uh, view of the detector. And we have also something which is very scientific, I would say, which is this one. You see, sometimes we found also ducks inside our data, <laughs> which is, you know, here is a really nice place, I would say. Uh, unfortunately, we, we do not experience uh, to have uh, these messages with the queens, uh, the songs. Sometimes we have uh, some uh, messages from the system, but they are announced with uh, some uh, short part of songs. Uh, it, I remember the queens, uh, the queen the songs. Yes. Uh... <laughs> okay, so uh, you see, it's a very friendly, user friendly co uh, control room. This one, I would say, we can have we have flowers, so we can eat. So you see, it's a sort of a uh, uh, group that works together, is uh, familiar. And then, okay, now we I come back and uh, okay, I, I will just uh, show uh, you can proceed now again. I would like to show the beam pipe of LHC as we go on the other side, uh, just to show how it is. And uh, I'm coming back. Okay, so maybe in the meantime, I can try to answer very quickly one of the questions. Um, so let me see what could be a very short one. So maybe a very quick one, can the detector detect antimatter? And the answer is yes, absolutely. So antimatter is uh, similar to ordinary matter, but it has a different charge, but it does have an electrical charge, which allows us to more easily detect those particles. So most charged particles that are produced in the detector, we can certainly detect. Sonia, back to you. Okay, frozen. It looks like we might have lost Sonia. Maybe there's an issue with the network. Um, oh, maybe they're back. Can you hear us, Sonia? Yes, yes, I'm back. I wanted just to show you, see? This is, okay, this is my finger. Okay, you can see. This is, uh, this is not a model, huh? okay? This is a beam pipe, of course, it's not used. We are not uh, on the LHC, but this is uh, basically, this is the cross-section of the beam pipe. And consider that the cross-section of the beam is uh, smaller than a human hair. So which is going inside here. I remember that I, I heard uh, uh, my colleagues describing uh, the fact that here you get the vacuum is a vacuum which is uh, higher than the vacuum in the space. So it's really uh, uh, a very, let's say, high vacuum. And then you can see here inside that this is a cut that they did just to show inside, uh, inside how this uh, beam pipe is done. And this is a part of, uh, here we have, uh, but then it's it's going. Uh, I don't like it. It's a part you see of the of a magnet, an electromagnet. Okay, and you can see here cables. Uh, these are cables uh, through which uh, we have uh, the the current flowing, uh, thirteen thousand amps, uh, and producing the the the. the the magnetic field needed to bend. This is for the Lorentz force. These are the two beam pipes. Okay, I think I, I stop here and I come back to the to you. Okay, thanks, Sonia. Um, so I think we hopefully have time to answer a few more questions. There's a lot of good ones, but Tunde, I don't know if you want to yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. I just want to make um, a little description of um, um, the LHC, uh, which is uh, it covered 27 kilometer. And I want to try to see how I can describe that uh, 
in Bini City. Uh, we have uh, a place called Bypass uh, in Bini City, and then it's not um, as um, of that length, but we can take from uh, Ring Road, we can, we can measure a radius from Ring Road to Ramat Park and try to draw a circle. That is a, a bit typical of the length of the LXC. Draw a, a radius from Ring Road to Ramat Park and draw a circle round. That's a typical of the size of the uh, LXC. All right. Okay. Um, all right. So we have Sonia back and we have a few questions. So I'll try to answer a few uh, rather quickly. So I'll just go, I think I'll try to go through each one. So one question is about how are particles such as the pos positron produced and injected into the collider? So the positron is the antiparticle to the electron, and we can produce positrons. We do not inject them into the LHC. So we don't uh, inject, we, we used to. So in, in the large electron positron collider many decades ago, or several decades ago, we did used to do that. So anti electrons are relatively simple to produce. And um, I'll just mention something very quick, which will answer a second question. So there's a different uh, experiment here at CERN called the antiproton decelerator. And there they can slow down antimatter and trap it. And they can uh, actually bring together an antiproton and an anti-electron and form an anti-hydrogen atom and they can study it. There's very interesting results recently about the gravitational interaction in anti-hydrogen. But just to mention that in that particular experiment in the anti-proton decelerator, particles are trapped. They're collected and they're studied. But in the LHC, we cannot do that. The particles are too energetic. So we study the aftermath of the interactions, the aftermath of the collisions. So in the LHC, we don't trap the particles. We only uh, record signals from that aftermath of the collisions. Um, so Sonia, there was a question for you. And very quickly, I might just try to find it. Um, so it says, I would like Sonia to speak more about what CERN does with the International Space Station and other space agencies. Ah, okay. <laughs> this is a very long, uh, really long uh, answer. I don't know if I can shrink it. Otherwise, we should propose another meeting just for question and answer. I if mean, uh, you, but I, maybe maybe very quickly. I mean, there's yeah. there's stuff here okay, at CERN. Okay, now okay, we we're talking. I I connect with the uh, uh, antimatter because basically. AMS, which the name is Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, uh, sometimes is referred as antimatter magnetic spectrometer. Basically, one of the topics uh, which uh, uh, AMS is working on is uh, to uh, to look for an cosmic antimatter. Uh, now, um, we should go to understand why the antimatter pro is a is a big issue for the physics. Uh, I don't know if I have time. Uh, basically, we are expecting, let's say, since the Big Bang, that 50% uh, of matter or antimatter was was uh, produced. But if we, if we observe our universe now, we see that m mostly is made of matter, at least what we can observe. And we uh, we ask ourselves why we can uh, we have a tiny percentage of antiparticles. But for example, as a, as uh, Andres was saying, uh, was mentioning, uh, we do not see in a stable way, uh, in a natural status, if you want, uh, uh, anti-atoms. Why we do not have a periodic table of anti-elements? Uh, why this is not in nature? We don't know, frankly. We don't have uh, the, the, the answer to this. This is why there is uh, this, uh, um, uh, this branch of physics uh, looking for uh, antimatter's bodies uh, at CERN studying anti-elements we can produce uh, here as anti-hydrogen, which is the, the lightest elements, and in space because uh, there is an hypothesis. Maybe we we have still to look around much better and maybe there, they, we could catch signals, uh, for example, of anti-stars because they are just in a corner of the university we didn't check uh yet so this is uh, one of the job of an uh, of an ams looking for this signal but uh, there is a contribution uh to the dark matter searches also uh, in particular studying uh, 
the, the ratio between uh, uh, positrons and electrons. And then there is uh, what, uh, what we, can, we could consider less important, but it's not, uh, is just a monitoring of all the cosmic rays uh, reaching the Earth for uh, for uh, for the the our earth but also for the knowledge of what is around the earth and so there are many results i invite you uh, i would be happy to answer more maybe in another meeting uh, you can contact me uh, or um, you you drop in the site of ams02 uh, on the web uh, you will find the latest results uh, from AMS, which is in space uh, since uh, 2011, taking a huge amount of uh, statistics, uh, uh, not compared as LHC, of course, but however. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, at this point, I think we can take questions from the audience. So if you have a microphone, you can ask directly. Hello, can you hear us? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. This is from Ivasto Bini. Um, our student. Okay. So, student, is a question time. If you have a question you want to ask or you want to make some clarification, yes. So, don't come out this way. In fact, you can follow him. More questions? Any other question? Anybody want to ask me? Oh, I, I want to know from this way. Okay, yes. Can, can go I want to know can the um, LHC tell us why there is more matter than antimatter? That's an excellent question. Um, so we mentioned earlier very briefly that there are four large detectors in the LHC uh, or around the LHC tunnel. And one of those detectors is, it, its main mission is to investigate the asymmetry between matter and antimatter. So as Sonia just said, we, you know, in the early universe, we expect that there to be an equal amount of matter and antimatter. Nowadays, we really don't see any antimatter. So the LHCB experiment uh, is investigating this very question. And, you know, Elaborating more is a bit complicated, but they're looking at certain processes and certain types of particle decays that can hopefully provide a hint on why, I mean, the, the technical term would be something like baryon asymmetry. So they're trying to find something about dark, uh, sorry, something about uh, antimatter that's different from matter. Uh, and that's just in the LHCB experiment there's many many uh, research programs and analyses that are studying this yes if i can uh, rephrase just to say that what we are doing on the ground basically is uh, to produce uh, to study processes uh, to understand if there are uh, physical laws justifying the fact that antimatter is not stable uh, what AMS is doing in space, uh, on the other hand, is really for uh, looking for possible uh, bodies of, an, of antimatter. But I would like to stress that, uh, again, this is, uh, we are talking about uh, um, bonding states of antimatter. Because if we talk about antiparticles, this is not a problem, a single antiparticle. We know so well antiparticles. For example, we use in hospitals. So when you do the PET scan, the positron tomography, we are using positrons. So antiparticles, they are not a mystery. We can produce them. Uh, OK, I don't want to say that we know everything, because a physicist, they know very well that we don't know anything. But however, we know. What is really the mystery is why the antimatter is unstable when coming to atoms or bodies, why there is no an anti-star. This is the real, and the LHCB is contributing to this, and also the, the recent result confirming the uh, Einstein relativity, general relativity theory that matter and antimatter, they behave in the same way as uh, um, uh, with respect to the gravity, is just a confirmation, another confirmation of Einstein theory 
uh, is just to say that we have to look uh, much farther and maybe we invite people there to join uh, this <laughs> this hunt this hunting because it's really it's really weird I can tell you it's really weird we don't know really what is happening there okay so I think we're happy to answer more questions if there's questions from the audience okay. thank you very much that was, that was a fantastic question okay please pass the microphone to me do we have more questions okay after here please go take the microphone um, my question is that what is the data analytic approach towards such model the data analysis approach towards this model Please, can you come again? Uh, my question is, what is the data analysis approach to all this uh, model? What data analysis is approach to the model. Are... So we, we understood data analysis, but yeah. I don't understand the rest. Sim simply put, how does time analyze those each data that are collected from the detectors? Is that a question? OK. Okay, the the data uh, yes, we the data collected from the detectors, and after they have gone through filtrations, uh, looking for interesting physics, the one that uh, so interesting to us, and um, we filter them, and uh, at the end we get just a minute uh, of the uh, of the raw data. We discard the remaining, and we export this data. To, uh, to our different data centers for further analysis and experiments by the physicists. So it's a raw, it's a raw uh, data to them to study and to, to look for more interesting physics. So maybe I can say a very, very quick word because there was also a, a question in the Q&A about this. So generally, when we talk about physics analysis, I think the simplest way to think about it is that we collect data from our detector and we study it. But the way that we study it is that we have a description or a model, we call it the standard model, that allows, to, allows us to predict what will happen when these particles come together. So it is uh, we can simulate this process. And in fact, we have to simulate how these particles interact with every material in the detector. And that's what we compare, right? So we take a simulation of these, these collisions we do that over and over and over again. So we have a collection, a large collection of simulated collisions. And then we compare that to the real thing, to the data that we have collected. And that's oversimplify oversimplifying many, many things, but that's the process. If there's something in the data that does not agree with the simulation or with the prediction, then we know that we either don't understand the prediction or simulation well enough, and there may be a problem there, or maybe there's something in the data that we didn't account for, which is very exciting. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that and very, very briefly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> now, I wanted just to say that, uh, in fact, this simulation um, that we need to, to produce basically as a... Is as a as a, there is an echo. Basically, is as a, if you have a function and you put your data dots on the top of this, you overlap. But consider that for... Each data, you need to produce uh, 10 events of simulation, which means that uh, basically the farm you have seen here, uh, just on the, on the uh, which was for the trigger here in CMS, uh, then we have the, um, uh, the, the computing center here at CERN, but then uh, the, the, the computing farm uh, from CERN uh, spread around uh, really all the, the earth. We have what we call the grid, uh, which is a really a, a distributed, uh, computing uh, uh, system uh, that uh, if we have uh, these uh, centers uh, you can have uh, nice pictures uh, uh, on the on, uh, on the uh, CERN web uh, you just look for grid and you will see that we have uh, many levels uh, of computing uh, where you can uh, simulate data and uh, you can uh, give send back these uh, simulated data to CERN it's not just uh, what hap happens here and uh, I would say I'm not an expert of computing, but uh, the first thing is that you cannot have a, one unique uh, center of computing uh, because if something uh, goes wrong, for example, a power cut, you lose uh, your power, everything. So you need to distribute uh, everywhere 
and also because uh, uh, you have seen the cooling. You would need a lot of cooling system for these electronics all together inside the room. So it, it's uh, really uh, something, uh, let's say, not complicated, but complex. Okay, so I see there's a hand raised uh, from the University okay. of Jos. Maybe we can give them a chance. We, we, we have one more question from Let's take that one quickly. One more question from University of Vinny. Let's take that one quickly, please. Um, uh, before I ask my question, I want to say uh, I know that this experiment will have cost a lot of money and investment. So, my question is what is the benefit of this experiment? Why do you study the behavior of particles? And also, what is the scientific law applied to it? So I didn't quite understand, but the question sounded something like what motivates the research and what are the physical laws? And this is a question which we could talk about for approximately seven hours, more. <laughs> even more. So this question is, is um, very, very broad. But my miniature answer is what motivates us is curiosity about the behavior of matter at the smallest scales. That's what we're trying to understand. We're trying to describe the fundamental building blocks of matter and how they interact, how they behave. And this is the way we can do it is we have a collider that can help us probe the smallest scales. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I mean, that's, that's a very, very short answer, but I, Otherwise, it would be very long. I can say my can personal say uh, answer. Yes, of course, a curiosity, I would say, as in any other job in the life. So if you are curious, you have already uh, gained. And then uh, for us is curiosity in how, at least for me, how it can happen, something can happen. And uh, this is, uh, I have to say, I'm so happy that uh, even after all the technicality I've learned, I still keep this enthusiasm. And maybe I could add not only the smallest, but also the biggest for me. <laughs> yeah, so maybe one more thing I would add. So you asked about what is the fundamental law of nature that applies? And the answer is probably all of them. Now, I also, I don't particularly, you know, I don't really tend to use the word law of nature because science, theories that are scientific, mathematical models, their descriptions, their models, and what we do, the curiosity that we're talking about has to do with how can we improve those models? There's no scientific theory that is set in stone, right? We can always explore. Thank you. Yeah, so right, let me try to get the University, University of, Jos. of Jos. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, so go on. Okay, please, uh, I want to know what are the dimensions of the CMS uh, detector? Yeah, so this is 15 meters tall, meters tall. and the yeah, and length the... of the detector is something like 35 meters or so, or 35 to 40. Okay. All hopefully. right. We still yeah. have another question from University of Jos. I want to know. Uh, you said the level one trigger. The level one trigger takes just snapshots of the aftermath of the collision. Then, how do you get to know other properties of the subatomic particles created after the collision, such as mass? electrical properties, do you have some sort of sensors? Or, I don't this is know, an excellent question. Is anything that records those? Yes, so okay. I mean, I can just very, very briefly uh, try to answer that. So that is a fantastic question. So when you talk about what the detector sees, right? We, we just have signals in different parts of the detector. So. After the fact, after we collect the information from the different parts of the detector, we have to be a bit like a detective. And in order to 
um, measure so such things that you're describing. So the charge, the mass, the velocity of the particles, we need to put together a lot of information. So just to give you an example, we can re we can reconstruct the trajectory of charged particles as they travel through the silicon tracker. And the curvature of that, uh, of that particle tells us something, of the charged particle tells us about its momentum. So a very energetic particle will basically travel straight. A charged energetic particle will travel nearly straight because it has a lot of momentum. A particle that is carrying less momentum, which is the product of the mass and the velocity, will curve significantly on the under a, a large magnetic field. So, Sonia, do you want to add something? Yes, okay. It was more technical about uh, the, the job done by the, the two, the two systems, because basically what you get from the cavern are um, a lot of signals, okay, as Andre said. And then uh, the first job for the level one is uh, to select on the on a hardware basis. It means that basically, basically you select data, uh, for example, uh, um, up, up to a certain current value or uh, inside the window, window of a voltage. So this is really a hardware selection. And, what, and the, you do also another job in the level one, which is uh, if you are, uh, I don't know if you are, uh, let's say, uh used the, with the confident with the, with the, the, the object oriented the, you start to form these uh, software objects that we call then electrons which are of course not the particle themselves but they already carry the information that andres was saying so when the data after this restyling and selection they are they go out the level one trigger which is the one i've shown underground and they reach the high level trigger on surface that we went uh, later um this uh, the high level receives already these objects called electrons photons protons muons with with they um let's say id card energy momentum uh, sign of the electrical charge etc and at that level you apply an additional selection to say, for example, I want just electron with an energy between 5 GV and 100 GV, and that's it. And this is a pure software selection. And on the top of this, as Tunde said, uh, even if uh, you, you cut a lot, you still have enough data to do all the physics, uh, to satisfy all the curiosities uh, of physicists. I should say that this selection is agreed uh, uh, before starting the run. So everybody puts on the table, I would like to study this, I would like to study this. And so the selection is made in such a way that everybody can find the useful data at the very end of this chain. So maybe I can add just a very, very quick and hopefully concrete example. So if you consider muons, when a muon is produced in our detector, it's already a bit surprising, right? So a muon you know, inside of the protons that are colliding, we have quarks and gluons. There's no muons in there. So if you ask yourself, where's that muon come from? The answer is from the concentration of energy that we put together. All this kinetic energy together uh, basically is converted into mass. So you can say E equals MC squared, that kinetic energy transforms into a muon that's created. And so that muon is a charged particle. So it will leave tracks in the innermost part of our detector, in our in the tracking, silicon tracking detector. And we can already get a sense of the momentum of that muon based on its curvature. It basically doesn't leave much signals in the calorimeters. It punctures through the magnet and then it deposits some signals in the muon systems. So two things here. So that already gives you a lot of information about the muon. The curvature tells you about its momentum. We can try to measure the curvature also in the muon system. And furthermore, that is also one of the interesting things. That's one of the trigger selection rules that we have. If, if we get something that kind of looks like a muon, we try to collect that, generally speaking. And in fact, it's, it's, so, it's so important. Muon said that we have also, you see, in the log of CMS, 
all these uh, tracks, I don't know if you can see, these are just muons inside the detector. So this is really is a peculiar thing because uh, CMS uh, is using just one magnet uh, to do a double measurement in the inside of the magnet and outside the magnet. All the other experiments, they need at least one magnet more. <laughs> that other peculiarity. Yeah, so do you have more questions? All right, thank you. Thank you so much for answering that. So we have um, just one more question, which is um, we understand that the Higgs boson was discovered in 20, um, 2012. And then um, and it is also called the God particle, which is um, lays the foundation for everything we have on the universe. So, but then uh, practically we could not um, we could not uh, understand how the Higgs boson is. We could not calculate its uh, position and so on. So, but then uh, how do we statistically or how do we then conclude that this is um, a particle that um, this is actually a particle that lays the foundation of the universe. Thank you. Okay, that's a very, very good question. That's a very, very good question. question. It's a very little very bit complicated. So in order to answer that, just maybe a little bit of historical context. So as you said, the Higgs boson was discovered at CERN by the CMS and Atlas collaborations on July 4th, 2012, after decades and decades of trying to find it. So the Higgs was first postulated in the 60s. And in order to understand what, you know, why we expect there to be this new particle, you need to get a bit of context about what, you know, the context behind it is quantum field theory. And I'm not going to get into the details, but we expect that there are many quantum fields in the universe. In fact, there's one associated with each uh, particle. So there's an electron field, there's an electromagnetic field that's, of course, associated with a photon, and there's a Higgs field. And the Higgs field is really what's important about the Higgs mechanism and about, about the origin of mass in fundamental particles. Now, the Higgs boson, the Higgs particle, is a manifestation, it's an excitation of that Higgs field. And what the way we can produce that particle is that we concentrate a lot of energy, we excite all of those quantum fields, and if we're lucky, from the quantum, sorry, from the Higgs field, we can produce a Higgs boson, and then it decays immediately. Immediately means around 10 to the minus 23 seconds, so we can never see the Higgs boson, so that's when the question becomes more complicated, and that's, I think that's the point of your question. We don't see the Higgs, we see the aftermath of its decay. So the Higgs can decay in multiple ways. And in order to for us to be able to say that we've discovered the Higgs with enough confidence, we have to play the same detective game and also the same game where we are comparing the prediction with our observation. So we can prepare a prediction or a simulation where we say the Higgs does not exist. How would things, how would these collisions look like? And then we take many, many, many simulations and we compare them to many actual uh, collision uh, snapshots or, or, you know, the actual data we collected. And then we see that the data looks different. There's something in the data that's missing from the simulation. And then we conclude based on other factors, such as the end product means that the initial particle had to be neutral, for example, and many other factors about the way that it's decaying, we use all that information to say, this looks like a Higgs boson. That's the shortest that I can make this, but if you have any other, anything to add, yes, Sonia. Yes, okay, no, just I wanted to say that the, the Higgs boson is not the only particle that we cannot see. And basically uh, our job uh, when we do data analysis is to trace back what we see in the detector and mainly what we see in the detector, uh, as you have uh, you well understood, are uh, um, electrons, uh, muons, uh, uh, protons. Uh, and so we trace back to understand uh, who was the mother particle. We really call it that. So we see the daughters or maybe the, the nephews <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we want to go back to the mother or the grandmother 
this is how we do and of course we have to respect for example if a particle is produced i have two daughters from a common mother it means that this particle particle is coming from the same physical point so this is something that this is why we need the precisions and we need other things and then okay i would like to add that of course precisely we announced to the world that there was this this discovery in 2004 or july 2012 but to be honest, uh, in the corridors, uh, we already had something. I can tell you what happens on the other side. Okay, you know, when there is a discovery moment, uh, you, you go in the corridors and you, you feel uh, this atmosphere and you feel people just asking each other, how is doing uh, this peak? Because we see a particle with a peak. Is it growing? Is it lowering? Because uh, you add statistics and uh, you, you, you expect. And what happened for uh, the X boson was that this peak was growing and growing at the level that at a certain point uh, there was no doubt that there was a new particle. We didn't uh, call this uh, immediately X boson. We just said that there was a new particle. And then uh, studying the characteristic, we associated this particle to the X boson. This is just uh, something behind the corridors. <laughs> Great. Um... So I think we, I'm happy to answer more questions. I think Sonia might have to get going soon, but uh, yeah, if there's more questions. Really, we can collect I questions think, yeah. also. You can adjust. Yeah. Uh, if not, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think. All right. Uh, I think uh, we also like to say that uh, we are in the, chamber where the uh, detector was lower than. Yeah, this is exactly where the detector was lower than in this chamber, from here to the 100 miles uh, below the surface. And um, I want to uh, thank our expert guides, Sonia and Andres and, and the technical crew, they are our directors and guiding us and uh, on, on what to do and uh, how to move well and uh, it's not that uh, to say kudos to them and i want to say this that um uh, it's possible that uh, we can uh, revisit um cms uh, detector and then uh, i think i'll be looking towards uh, when we can have uh, direct access when sonia can take us real close to the detector Yes, and, and I think we are going to work towards that when we can see the detector live. Um, that will be between uh, November and uh, February period. So we can revisit uh, these detectors and prepare more questions to ask our expert guys. So thanks to um, a university as well, uh, which is in collaboration with, uh, with SEN, uh, University of Bini, uh, for giving us this privilege and this opportunity. Thanks to my VC. Professor Salami and the uh, Professor Bankoli, who is the team leader of the Uniben uh, SEN and collaborations. And thank to all the audience from Nigeria. Um, I think we are good to go. All right, thank you so much. Yes, okay. Um, if we will uh, replan another visit, I will be happy to join uh, this visit. And just to say, if in case uh, some of them, they couldn't uh, join uh, uh, in, the, in the next events, just uh, if you can uh, try to come to CERN and okay to visit CERN or to work at CERN. Consider that there are, as uh, we already we are showing here, there are not only physicists, not only engineers. Uh, there are technicians. Uh, there are also lawyers. Uh, there are uh, uh, chefs. There are many kind. It's a small town. We are really happy to have you here. And uh, we have also some programs online that uh, we could maybe uh, you can have a, a look or you can ask uh, as uh, the master classes. Uh, let's see. Let's say we can keep in contact. Thank you very much, Sonia. Um, thank you so much, everybody. Um, I think um, for this um, particular event, we had um, 84 um, institutions, um, universities, colleges of education. Um, in Nigeria joined. Um, I think two schools from Ghana um, and one from Kenya also joined um, this visit. So thank you so much to everybody. It's so beautiful um, to see that um, we're just excited about this. Um, and Sonia, um, I got um, some 
um, WhatsApp DMs about you. Um, so it happens that um, a lot of them I've seen, I don't know, videos of you or something I really don't know, but I got a lot of that. Um, so thank you so much. It's good to see you. And Andreas particularly uh, took me the last time when I was at CERN. Um, so it was my own tour guide uh, the last time when I was at CERN. It's fantastic um, to see you again. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Tsunde. Um, thank you so much to the University of Benin, um, the major part uh, of all of this. Mr. Martin is not here, but I mean, he's been really, really um, instrumental and pivotal to the success of this um, event. So I think that's it from me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.